Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Um, as Shalini mentioned, so today's webinar is on getting copy number data from next generation uh, sequencing platforms. Uh, I want to start with giving an overview of this technology. As most of you are quite familiar with this, the NGS platforms do enable you to do rapid sequencing of various uh, genomic materials like DNA or RNA, etc. Uh, this equipment generates uh, quite a large volume of raw sequence data in the form of short sequence reads. And um, this sequencing can be done either on whole genome or whole exome uh, to reduce the cost, or even on specific uh, regions' panels, uh, G panels. Um, the technology does require considerable uh, computational power, both in the forms of computer hardware and software support to process, store, manage all the data that gets generated by the technology. Um, so what do you get from NGS? Uh, so it's used for different purposes. One of the most commonly used applications is called RNA-seq, where it's used to quantify expression of transcripts and possibly identify new forms or spliced uh, variants. Um, also, there uh, is application in looking at interaction of proteins and DNA with the chip seq technology methylation. Um, for new organisms, there's de novo sequencing, and then look at analysis of the DNA, uh, identification of small variants like SNPs or indels, and um, a growing area of interest, which is getting copy number variations with this, and sometimes referred to as CNV seq. Uh, I do mention that um, this CNV seq as uh, technology should not be confused with CNV seq as an algorithm uh, developed to do that. Um, I know there's, that has caused confusions in the past. Um, so today's webinar is really going to concentrate primarily on this last bullet and to some extent a bit on, on sequence variants in DNA. So this is a simplified uh, NGS data processing pipeline where raw sequence uh, files, uh, that's a type of file to start here. Um, then some filtering step happens where the QC, each read QC is evaluated and some things uh, might be uh, thrown out. And then uh, at the alignment, which is very crucial, step to a reference genome happens. And at the end of this process, you generally get a file called a BAM file, uh, which would be a uh, aligned sequence file, and then a variant call file or a VCF file that uh, can denote what the variants are. So what uh, we'll also talk about in today's webinar is another way of, of showing that is how do you go through, uh, starting with the short sequence read, you go through the alignment, then to get copy number data, uh, there are different approaches. One which we will talk extensively about is the depth of coverage, or DOC method. And once you go through this step of uh, pre-processing or computing uh, values, that can go into Nexus copy number, which is a product that we have uh, for further analysis. Um, there are other methods that can also get copy number um, data out of NGS. They're read pair and split pair, as an example. Uh, we won't cover those in detail here. Uh, you can also Take the short sequence read, and if it's a de novo, uh, you can create, um, do an assembly, and then bring that data into Nexus copy number. Um, the advantage of this, uh, as we go through the copy, uh, Nexus copy number software, is it's very flexible as far as the data type that you can bring in. And um, just put this paper up which was a couple of years ago that was a nice review in bioinformatics of different methods that are proposed for making copy number calls. So these are the depth of coverage methods, uh, pair end methods, uh, split reads, et cetera. And you can see that a few years ago there was a number of methods proposed. And more recently, this is another review article that just came out in plus one. And you can see the number of algorithms for um, doing this type of work is growing. So we're not going to have an exhaustive uh, review of all of this, but we'll concentrate on uh, just uh, a sampling of that. Um, 
one more item before proceeding is once you get your copy number data, um, you can also get uh, smaller NDLs and SNPs, the variant calls. And you can bring all of that into Nexus copy number and have an integrated view of all the changes that are happening in the DNA for a single sample and aggregate that up uh, for multi-sample analysis. So let's just start with the simple uh, approach. So how do you get copy number from, from ReadDef? Uh, so if you go by the premise that uh, the sequencing is done randomly, so you get these uh, short reads distributed uniformly across the genome, then it would be very simple. So you would just divide up the genome into small bins and then count how many reads you're getting. So if you're getting six reads here, six here, seven here, so forth, and you plot this out, say, well, you know, this area I'm getting 14 reads. So that this is possibly a gain. Um, if this was a uniformly distributed um, read count. Um, but that's really not the case. So you, you really want to compare to what you expect, uh, an expected profile. So if you have an expected profile that kind of runs well, this blue line, then when you get 14 reads, you say, well, that's not really a gain because that was, you would expect to get some number very close to that. But in this area, um, you would have expected to get something close to two, but now you're at six, so that might be possibly a gain. So the key here is is really uh, trying to get um, what coming up with this expected profile. I think um, if you think about this as like an array CGA type of experiment, it's what's your reference that you're going to compare to. So just like a array CGH, if you had or the original array CGH uh, comparison, so if you had a tumor and a normal pair. Uh, so let's say this is your tumor and this is your normal. Um, you take the same binning approach, and then for your normals, you count. You say, well, this is my expected value. So I expect to get 9, 15, et cetera. And then you create a log ratio, just like you would with a array CDH type of an approach. And then your gains will be where you get positive numbers. Your losses will be where you get negative log ratio numbers. So this is uh, a method that uh, we can talk about uh, in more detail. Um, but before going there, what are the sources of uh, noise in read depth? So one of the biggest sources of noise uh, that has been reported comes with the GC bias and how much, uh, what's the actual sequence uh, percentage of GCs in the sequence. And that has a, a nonlinear effect on the read depth. Uh, there's other things like map mappability of a region, how unique that sequence is, uh, different types of batch effects that, uh, with reagents, with library prep methods, etc. cetera. Um, so you can go back into what same problem. Sometimes uh, you, know, you don't want to reinvent the wheel many times. You just go back to the same situation in microarray times. Uh, about uh, five to seven years ago, um, we, in microarray analysis, we observed similar type of problem. So this is a, a paper in 2008. And uh, you look at the log ratio plot for a normal chromosome 11, which should have been right at zero. People observed that, well, it's not really nice and flat. You get lots of noise. And if you look at the median value, there's a wavy net to this. So what people did back then was, look at the GC percentage across chromosome 11 as an example here. And if you look at sample one, there's a very nice direct correlation. So when you have more GC um, in that region, you get a higher log ratio value. And if you have less GC, you get lower log ratio value for sample one. And for sample two, it's actually the reverse of that. So then if you plot that out, you can see it's a nice linear relationship. Now, if you, if you have this, if you understand that, oh, this is what's causing the problem, what's causing the variation, um, then you can do a correction, a systematic correction for that to make this be nice and flat as opposed to being going up or down. Um, so the question becomes, 
is it um, should you do a linear fit? Should you do a quadratic fit, or should you have a more flexible type of LOS fit? Um, and uh, what we ended up doing for microarray in Nexus was allow the user to the software to really be able to run any of these, and not just on GC because. Uh, in addition to the GC of the target region, the GC of the probe was important, the fragment length was important, and um, the GC of the fragment itself. Um, so Nexus has an infrastructure for you to be able to create pretty much any parameters that, that you want and do any type of fitting. Um, back then, for microarrays, there were all these algorithms that used different um, types of uh, fit to different factors. So that is essentially generalized. So we can take the same approach and apply it now to NGS. So just to give you an ex a quick example, this was uh, on an array. This is before GC correction. You can see there's a very big waviness going on here. And afterwards, it cleaned that up very much. So um, we'll get to that uh, application now uh, to NGS. But uh, before that, I just want to talk about some of the methods for whole exome uh, that um, can be used for matched uh, samples. So one of the simplest methods or early methods were the NDCGH developed by Dr. Sean Davis at the NCI. There's a Python script on this that you can run yourself and, and generate uh, the, the log ratio values. And I'll get into this in more detail. Um, there's an algorithm called convex. And in fact, there are two algorithms, both called convex. This one uh, from a group in Singapore, and the other one is from a group uh, out of Sanger. Um, this one uses a hidden Markov model and uh, wavelet tree processing. So it's quite a bit different. Uh, it does use a match sample. And then there's an algorithm from the French group called Control Freak. Um, and uh, this uses either a match sample, and if you don't have it, it tries to create a, a reference by itself. Um, so what I'm going to cover is just really the, the, the basic NDCGH approach, which is very intuitive and something simple, but it does work. So in NDCGH, you have a single parameter, N, uh, which is analogous to window size, and uh, N really determines the window size. So uh, you say, I want to have 10 reads or uh, a 1,000 reads in the reference. And then it counts the number of reads in the same region from the tumor sample and creates a ratio and estimates the copy number from that. So example is easy to, to show this. I think it's easier. So if you set n to 10, you take your reference and you figure out how much you have to read to get 10 read, reads in that space. And then for that area, you count how many uh, reads you have for your uh, tumor. And then you go 10 more and you count. Uh, you go 10 more. In this case, you can see you have to go quite a bit longer and count. So as you can see, this is good for exome uh, arrays because um, the space is not fixed, just like a, it would be for a normal binning. Um, so once you have that, oops, you create ratios and you can proceed. Um, so this is the basics of NDCGH. We have NDCGH now implemented in Nexus 7.1. Um, so you can load the BAM file in there and have it processed. Uh, but what uh, you get if you run it through um, Nexus is the, all the other infrastructure that comes afterwards. So you can perform the systematic correction to remove GC bias, which would be very useful. And uh, then for the actual calling, the, the, the fast two segmentation algorithm can be used uh, to apply the Markov model to that. And um, then beyond that, what is possible is to create essentially a BLE frequency calculation uh, from the BAM files. And I'll have a whole slide on this later. But uh, then you can apply SNP fast segmentation on this, which would give you advantage of looking at both copy number and allele frequency data uh, to make better calls and also detect regions of homozygosity. So um, 
you can have pretty much a very nice and complete process in that sense. So I uh, wanted to show you a quick example of NGCGH that, that, that we did with Dr. Skeeting and Lee from CHOP on a few owner and recipient pairs. And uh, in this case, uh, we ran it through NGCGH. And if you just take the NGCGH raw data, it doesn't look too bad, it's, but it has a bit of the waviness in here. Once we apply a very generic uh, GC correction on it, it, it really cleaned this sample up quite a bit. Um, I don't want to tell you that everything works perfectly on all samples. We had some other, uh, I have two examples of what I call poor quality. This one uh, with no GC correction, you can see it looks like a nightmare. And afterwards, it did improve it a bit, but not nearly enough to make uh, any decent uh, copy number calls. And this is another example of that. So we're looking into why some of these samples might behave this way, but the bigger questions become, all right, if I don't have a pair of samples, how would I handle this? Where is the noise coming from? So uh, we do require having methods that do not have matched samples. And um, and if, if it's not GC, what else is there? So a couple of, um, yeah, see more typos, uh, a couple of uh, algorithms were recently uh, suggested that use the singular value decomposition of PCA method. Um, and in this case, uh, you do not require a mass samples, but you take a whole population of samples and then identify trends, major trends in that data uh, using FCD, and then you take those things out, the major trends. Um, now, the issue is if you're working with rare events, so uh, looking at autism or things like that, this might work quite well. But if you're working with cancer, uh, where you do have major trends that are pathogenic related to the disease, this uh, might not be a good approach. So just to give an overview of the SVD, um, you, you have to have a relatively significant population of samples, maybe a few hundred. And then you create a read depth uh, matrix of samples by genomic position, and then you apply linear algebra to factor that uh, matrix into uh, another vector kind of matrix. Uh, elements of that vector are called eigenvalues, and the vectors in the matrix are called eigenvectors. And if you sort them, the largest eigenvalue carries the most information about the, the, the underlying data. So the first principal component talks about what's the biggest source of variation in data. In the normal usage of this method is for dimensionality reduction, because what's done is um, you get rid of the smallest eigenvalues uh, because they don't carry that much information. The way they're used in Conifer and XHMM, in fact, is to identify the hypothesis or the assumption there is that the largest uh, variances are actually noise. So the, the largest eigenvalues are, are used to thrown out and, and remove the noise. So as I mentioned, there are these two methods that are very uh, similar. Um, both require a number of samples to be processed together, and both uh, use an SVD approach to remove the highest rank principal component. Uh, now, anywhere from 5 to 20, and the paper makes it clear that you have to take care in, in deciding where to draw the line, because if you throw out too much, too many principal components, you could be throwing out the data, uh, the actual real variations as well. And if you throw out too few, you might be left with noise. Um, there, they, in the paper, they also talk about the fact that some of the principal components go with obvious things like GT, but some of the high value principal components are things that they had no idea what uh, it meant with the, the linear combination of, of multiple factors. 
Um, so personally, it, it feels a little strange to be removing things that you don't know what they are. So hopefully, these are there will be better methods uh, that will come that that um, are more uh, take advantage of the known variations. So conifers pretty much stops once it does this step. If there is no real calling. It gives you a Z score at at every uh, point. Uh, but XHMM goes the next step and has a hidden Markov model with three states afterwards to make a call uh, for a normal gain and loss region. So um, what you could do or what we've done is you can take the output of conifer and put it into Nexus and identify the Nexus uh, fast algorithm as a different HMM um, to make the call. But in addition, as I mentioned before, what you could do is you can actually get BLU frequency from NGS data by, if you have sufficient uh, depth, uh, you can filter out for common SNPs and then calculate a minor allele frequency and then com uh, combine the copy number and the BLU frequency into one data that can be let uh, loaded into Nexus. And then you can apply the SNP fast to algorithm because it's quite flexible on setting the state, it can apply here, and you can get copy number and LOH regions at the same time. Uh, so a pipeline would be something like this, where you get your NGS equipment, then go through your bioinformatics pipeline, generate the BAM and VCF file, go into Nexus, you get calls, the red indicates uh, copy number loss, the blue indicates copy number gain and amplification is in this sample. Um, and then the yellow indicates regions of LOH. And then these little points that are coming up are sequence variants uh, like deletions and uh, SNPs, point mutations. So you can get a complete integrated view of that sample. Now, just to show you one example, um, we got data from a group in Nijmegen, Netherlands, um, where they took a sample and ran it through both affymetric cytoscan as well as whole exome sequence. Um, after the sequencing, they did this on a few hundred samples. They processed it through a conifer uh, to convert into BAM files at each uh, exon. There's a z-score. And then we loaded that data the pair into Nexus. So over here you can see the NGS results uh, with some of the, the structural variants in addition to copy number variations. And down here you can see the, the Affymetrix uh, cytoscan data together. So I'll, I'll show you that live, but here are just a couple of pictures. Um, this is the result of the, the conifer output and this nice deletion that, that comes out. And as you can see, we, we fake the BLU frequency. So this area also shows up as being uh, homozygous, which is what you would expect since one allele is lost here. And you can see the probe um, density. So this is from the cytoscan, and this is the, the conifer output for that same region of the loss on 16P. So before showing you the, that data set live, I just want to uh, conclude with a few remarks. Um, first, that there is tremendous progress in computational methods uh, for doing this, getting copy number data from NGS. Um, the field is in relative infancy. I would say it's maybe adolescent now, uh, certainly compared to a much more mature microarray technology getting copy number from arrays. Um, so if you are uh, using this technology and if you want to apply this technology, I think great care um, needs to be taken, in, especially in selecting the algorithm and making sure that the parameters are set uh, according to your data that you have. Um, my expectation is over the next couple of years, there's going to be um, much more development and uh, we will have uh, much more streamlined processing. So let me switch very quickly and uh, to this Nexus project where I have the AFI as well as the NGS data, so just for you to see. Um, this is the same sample 
And if I just bring up the the NDS results, let me filter out the point mutation so it's not so noisy looking. Um, you can tell, or you can see these are like insertions and deletions, and you have, for example, on chromosome 16, as I showed you earlier, if I zoom into this area, you could see that um, you get a nice deletion with the LOH event going on. And if I go actually to the whole genome plot, zoom out a little bit, um, this is the z-score range. It's nice and flat. You can make out this deletion here. Um, so what the Nexus uh, SNP uh, fast segmentation algorithm has identified is the deletion here. It's also identified as a deletion here on one, and you can see that there's a number of, of, of exons in this gene that are being lost. So how does this uh, compare with the microarray data? So if you look at this view, you can see that uh, here there's a consensus. We get 100% deletion here on that gene. Um, and if I show the probes, you can see the array definitely shows the probes being down, and you can see the same thing in the NGS drive values. So that that was nice to see here. Um, there is, so if I zoom out, and you look at other events, but the array is picking up more events than the NGS. Like this gain here is known in public databases as the CNP, as the common uh, polymorphism. Um, that the array picked up because it has so many probes at this location, and in fact, there was only a single probe on that one exon. Well, single probe. Uh, since Conifer just looks at the exon, it, it will miss anything that's not on the exon. So uh, if you look at something like this, it's missing that. And uh, if I look at this one here, it's on a gene, but it's in the intronic area. So um, if you look at the probes, you can see there's a whole bunch of probes here that, that show a loss, and it does map over to the DGV, and you can see there's known polymorphisms there. But um, they're all being, all those reads are filtered out in conifer, so you're only getting reads on the exon. All right, so I think at that point, this is covers what I wanted to to talk about. I see a whole bunch of questions, which I'm glad, so I'm going to start uh, going through them, and feel free to add more as I go through. Um, so the first question is, how many reads do you recommend to use as a reference when analyzing tumor normal care? Um, so reads, I, I guess maybe you're talking about the, the depth of coverage, which is, of course, the answer is the more is, is better. Um, I think typically people use anywhere between 10 to 30 uh, X um, on that. Uh, the nice part about something like NGCGH is that if you tell it how many reads, so let's say, and maybe that was your question, um, the window that we use is, I think, a 1,000 reads in the reference, and then it, it calculates uh, how big that is the other side. Um, then I have another question, just, okay, three questions together. Um, GC correction, for different NGS platforms, do you need to apply different GC correction algorithms, i.e. Illumina versus Solid? Uh, very good question. And um, as I mentioned uh, before, that one of the big problems right now is that, uh, people don't really don't know um, what are all the sources of the variations and how big the GC windows should be and what fit. There was a nice paper by Benjamini and Speed on uh, GC correction and uh, how that can be approached. We're working on trying to find the best methods ourselves that we can recommend. Uh, the nice part with Nexus is you can do a lot of this types of experimentation, which is the state you're in um, yourself. You can create your own correction file. And, and try that. So my guess to answer your question is you uh, probably need to have different uh, sets. 
for NGCGH, do we need to normalize reads by library size before applying this algorithm? Um, I'm not sure uh, of that question. Uh, I don't think so because unless they, they change between your tumor and normal since they're wouldn't. But that's something that can go to the systematic correction file. And uh, let's see, there's another question I think here. It says, uh, what computing equipment is necessary to perform described tasks? I see. Um, how fast, etc. So there are different steps. So the steps that come in after you have so from the BAM file to getting the copy through NGCTH, that can actually run on a desktop computer or a laptop, and you don't really need a, a huge amount depending on the, the read depth. Um, but it certainly would be advantageous to run on a, on a faster computer. And then the data can be brought into Nexus. The nice part about that is that the Nexus will allow you to then take a load data as all sorts of different minimize this. So you can see, um, so you can run for the BAM and DCDH within Nexus, or you could pick, um, I think we have it as a standard now, there's a method called uh, NGS, which uh, you can load data that's been computed outside and bring that in and then apply the systematic correction uh, going forward. So depending on where you want to do what type of computation, you can essentially uh, move things around. Um, let me see. Is it possible to adjust conifer so it does not remove common uh, CMPs? Oh, so sorry, I, I didn't want to imply that conifer intentionally removes common uh, polymorphisms. So if I go back to here, the reason you didn't see anything uh, here uh, for that polymorphism, if I, well, good, yeah. the reason you don't have any probes there is because Conifer gives you an estimate of a copy number for each exon. So you see exon 12, it says it has a z-score of slightly negative number. So for in between, there is no exon. So Conifer doesn't give you any measure uh, if it's outside the exon boundaries. Uh, so if the, there was a loss of the whole region, it would have shown up. I thought I had to turn this thing off, but apparently not. OK. Um, so hopefully that, that answered that question. How does Nexus handle male versus female X chromosome deletions and duplications? Uh, good question. This is part of actually Nexus. If, if you have a, a column called gender in your data set tab, then it correctly um, adjusts the expected log ratios for that. Um, another question, what minimum number of control samples are needed for CNV estimation? Um, if that's with regards to methods like XHMM and, and Conifer, um, it really depends on the data, and I hate to say it that way, but uh, like the set here was 200 samples that were used, which was very nice if you have it. Um, if the data is very consistent, um, then you could have less, but it's really data driven. Um, what is the frequency of poor quality samples, and could this be overcome um, using clinical purposes? Uh, so there could be, as, as you probably know, a lot of factors that go into the quality of the sample. And uh, I'm not a person that's an expert on on the wet lab part of it. Uh, but if there's ways of fixing things, uh, systematic biases, like um, is assumed with the, the PCA approach, then that those can be handled computationally. But if there's something wrong in the wet lab part, then unfortunately, it, that needs to be fixed further upstream. Um, for clinical use, is it likely that the number of principal components removed cannot be varied? Um, yeah, so for 
That's a very good question, and I'm not sure uh, for clinical use. I find it a little bit troubling um, to use something with that TCA approach because you have to be very certain where to draw the line there, and, and uh, I'm not really sure if you want to do that for clinical purposes just yet. Um, for accurate CMV estimation, do you recommend pair end or single end? Uh, well, so we didn't talk about those methods, and in fact, I, in theory, um, those could give you better, I think, um, CMV detection, uh, but uh, it does require more uh, depth of coverage and more computational uh, approaches. We haven't covered that in detail in this webinar, but hopefully we will in future webinars. Um, have you tested the NGS CNV function for its sensitivity and specificity? Um, just like with microarrays, uh, to calculate sensitivity and specificity, uh, personally I'm not a very believer in that because to do that, you, you have to create synthetic data uh, or go with, you know, the, the thousand genome projects and things like that. Uh, you can adjust all of those measures so in Nexus. So if you look at how we process um, the conifer, there's a significant threshold and a few other parameters that you can adjust to decide what, how sensitive you want the system to be. Of course, the price you get to become more sensitive is, is a higher uh, false positive rate. So, for example, if you, if you look at this region in Nexus, and let me minimize that, um, you look at this probe here, or, or this measurement. So, Conifer says there's a my, less than a minus one Z score for that exon being deleted. Uh, but it's a single measurement. And do you want to make that call at that point? Given the fact that we ran with one E to minus six, the, the HMM model in Nexus says that, nope, that's not really sufficient for, for it to make a call at that point. And in fact, the only area that it felt confident was when it saw a bigger deletion that covers multiple exons in this case. Um, so you can make changes to your settings to to get to a desired sensitivity, um, but there, the technology itself doesn't carry that with it. Hopefully that's clear what I'm trying to say. Um, could one bring measurements from different platforms together like in microanalysis? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, well, here was an example where I took this sample from uh, an array and an NGS, so you can certainly mix and match things together. Okay, these are all great questions, and I'll be happy to answer more, but I think we should open up the polls, uh, shall we?